So it looks like uh, Arthur is getting ready. Uh, so let me just give you a, a short introduction. Um, Arthur Schweitman is, uh, has been a PhD student at the Technical University in Arsen. Uh, he has done a lot of work on global optimization on machine learning models. Uh, and he's been a very prolific uh, researcher during his time as a PhD student. Um, and today he's going to present for us uh, on the topic of hybrid modeling and optimization of processes. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot for uh, the invitation. Uh, thank you all for coming. I hope everyone can see my slides already. Um, yeah, as already mentioned, I will give a talk on hybrid modeling and optimization of processes. Um, so my talk will have uh, two parts, basically. So in the first part, I will talk about hybrid modeling. So I will introduce uh, model types. Uh, I will also talk about uh, standard structures for hybrid models. And I will briefly introduce physics-informed neural networks as well. And then in the second part of my presentation, I will mostly focus on optimization of hybrid models. So I will talk about the need for global optimization and a particular formulation in reduce space. And then uh, afterwards, I will very briefly mention uh, how you can guarantee the accuracy of surrogate models. And I will briefly mention the concept of validity domain learning for neural networks. Okay, let's start with hybrid modeling. So as you already uh, know... Sorry to, uh, to uh, stop you. Yeah, sure. uh, are you able to uh, increase the volume? Uh, of my microphone? microphone? Yeah, give me yeah, a second. A bit low, at least for me. Uh, um, does this work better already? Just a little bit low. Uh, Wait, give me a chance. Uh, I guess it works better now, does it? Yes. Okay, I will try my best. Uh, thanks for the comment. Um, so, okay, so why should we do hybrid modeling? Um, and this is like what, what I show here is just one application of many, and I'm sure you know way more. And later on, we have another presentation on a particular uh, application. But usually we get some data of a process. We combine this data with some mechanistic model that we have about our process in order to uh, create a digital twin or model of the process. And then we use that model for optimization. So what kind of models do we know? First of all, what you have learned uh, yeah, in your courses is usually related to white box modeling. What we mean by that is we model our process based on first principles or mechanistic model equations that we know. Uh, but creating such a model is very expensive because it takes time to develop the model, to understand the fundamentals of the process, uh, to validate the model and so on. And also, if we think about um, very complex models, uh, we need a specialized software to simulate such models. And this could be a CFD uh, program such as Comsol. Uh, and when we want to use such models, such a very complex models for optimization, usually that's quite difficult because, for example, we do not get the gradient information that we need for optimization. Uh, on the other side is if we have developed such a model and if we have included um, our uh, yeah, knowledge about the process, Usually we have very few parameters to fit and therefore we need very few data to learn this model. On the other side, uh, what you learned in this course probably is black box modeling. And one example for black box is a uh, neural network. And these data-driven models are based exclusively on process data. And they're very cheap to train. So we don't need a lot of uh, time for the development of the model and they're very cheap to evaluate. So once you've fitted a neural network, it's super cheap to get an evaluation. It's very robust. So for a white box model, for example, if you think about an Aspen simulation, uh, I guess everyone has experienced that it's quite a pain to get these to converge while evaluating a neural network is very robust. Also, we get all the necessary gradient information 
for example, that we need for optimization. However, as the black box models relies uh, purely on data, we usually need quite a large amount of data to fit these models. And in between those two models, there's a gray box model or hybrid model, which combines white box models and black box models. Um, so when we talk about white boxes, black boxes, and gray boxes, uh, what we usually mean is we mean parametric or non-parametric models. And what that means is uh, basically a definition from uh, mathematics. So parametric models basically means that the parameters are determined a priori based on the knowledge on the, about the process. So the number of parameters is fixed and finite. And in particular, the complexity of the model is bounded, even if we have unbounded data. And usually, like all of the white box models, fall into this category of model. While when we talk about uh, black box models, what we usually mean is non-parametric models. And these are models where the parameters are determined exclusively from data. While uh, the term non-parametric does not mean or does not imply that the model completely lacks parameters. Rather, the number of parameters is flexible and is not fixed in advance. So for example, if we think about Gaussian process model, the number of parameters grows as the amount of data grows. <clears throat> so before I talk about the advantages of hybrid models, let's first focus on the disadvantages of black box models. Um, so what you see here on the right hand side is uh, 1D example for uh, training data that is given here um, in this domain. And if we fit a neural network, for example, on this data, it could something could look like something like that. But it could also be a model called F2, given like this one. And what this sketch here illustrates is that when we talk about interpolation, so when we evaluate our model within the bounds of our data, this works quite well for data-driven models. But when we talk about extrapolation, so evaluating our black box models outside the bounds of our training domain, this is not possible with data driven models. Why? Because we have no knowledge whatsoever about this part of the domain of our model here. And therefore, when we train models, or in particular black box models, we always need to think about uh, yeah, fixing this domain omega of our black box model of the data that we trained the model on. Um, so let's go to this example here. What we want to train here is a function with a particular structure. So we have an uh, yeah, output y, which is given by the sum of two functions f1 and f2, where f1 is a function of x1 and f2 is a function of x2 here. And we have some data, some training data, this is distributed like this cross here. So if we go for the black box approach, so for example, for a neural network, where we have x1 and x2 as an input to this network and y as an output, we can train this neural network on this data. However, we should not evaluate the model in this domain here, down here, here, or here. Why? Because we evaluate the model outside its training range or training domain. And therefore, this would be an unvalid extrapolation of our model. And what that really means is that if we train such a black box model, we face a curse of dimensionality. What means basically that the number of data points that we need for training scales exponentially with the dimension uh, of the inputs of the black box. So this black box model has two inputs. So we need to cover this 2D space densely if we want to train this model. However, with a hybrid model, what we can do is we can exploit the structure of the data that we see. So we know basically that this data is the sum of two function and we can exploit it by fitting two separate black boxes for the functions F1 and F2 and we combine it with a mechanistic model. In this case here, the mechanistic model is basically the plus operator. 
So if we do that, we reduce the dimensionality of each black box. So here, we kind of break the curse of dimensionality and we can evaluate our model, the hybrid model, within this training data or within this domain here. Why? Because uh, each of the black boxes has only one input now. Okay, so this is only one example. When people talk about hybrid models or if you read literature, usually we see these two kinds of structures, the parallel structure and the serial structure. And which structure you actually use for your um, yeah, modeling purposes depends on both you as a modeler and also the known structure of the white boxes. Remember, we are only able to set up this hybrid model structure here because we know that the structure of our data is given like this. Okay, let's start with the parallel structure. What we see here is basically that uh, the inputs to the mechanistic model and the neural network are pretty much the same. And then usually we add up the predictions of the neural network and the mechanistic model. And in other words, what that means is the error of the mechanistic model is corrected by a data-driven model. So this could be the case when you model a chemical reaction using a mechanistic model, and then you use an ANN to correct for some uh, yeah, problems with the catalyst, uh, some degradation, for example, or deactivation of the catalyst. Um, however, we have a problem here. Because if the inputs to the black box and the white box are identical, we do not see or we do not have any structural advantage of the hybrid model. So basically the dimensionality of X here is the same for the mechanistic model and the black box. So in other words, we have to cover the whole uh, space so we do not break the curse of dimensionality when we use the parallel structure for hybrid modeling. And this can be different if we use a serial structure. And most commonly, uh, or the yeah, most simple ones, are these two. So first of all, we could have a neural network first and then a mechanistic model. Or maybe we have a mechanistic model first and then a black box model. Um, and these are basically suitable if you have uh, maybe no precise information about a particular mechanism. So one example could be that uh, the mechanistic model describes uh, a reactor, a chemical reactor, while the neural networks describes a kinetic model uh, for the chemical reaction. Uh, so this would be a yeah, classical example for a hybrid model structure here. And what's very important that you should use these hybrid model structures only if you know the actual structure. So if you enforce a wrong structure, this might lead to unphysical and wrong results, certainly. So if you want to use a hybrid model structure, you should also think about how can I train a hybrid model? Uh, and if we take, uh, yeah, this, this first case here with a parallel structure, what you can see is that you can get the inputs, usually you know them for the, your training. You can evaluate your mechanistic model to get and the outputs of the mechanistic model. And therefore you can pre-compute the inputs and the outputs of the black box. And the same is true for this serial structure here. So if you know the inputs X, you can compute your outputs of the mechanistic model. And then therefore you know the inputs and the outputs of the black box here. So therefore these two hybrid structures you can train using just any standard approach for model training. For example, backpropagation in TensorFlow for neural networks. Uh, and this might be a little more difficult for this structure here, because in this case, you do not know the outputs here of your uh, data-driven model, but you have only data X and Y given. Uh, and there are different uh, ways to train this model. Usually, if you go to the literature, people differentiate between a direct approach and a simultaneous approach, where they mean with direct approach that you somehow use a mechanistic model uh, yeah, in the inverse way, basically, to estimate the inputs of the mechanistic model, which are, on the other hand, the outputs of the neural network. Um, and then afterwards, you can train the 
neural network just as normal. However, this is not, yeah, it's not always working um, because solving this inverse problem might lead to uh, high uncertainty in the parameters or might not even be possible at all. Uh, and therefore, uh, other people propose to use a simultaneous approach uh, where, uh, where you basically train both models simultaneously. Uh, but you should remember that this really depends on the mechanistic model again. So let's say you have a very simple mechanistic model, like the one I showed you earlier on with a plus operator, basically. You can also implement this in TensorFlow, get the gradients and everything works smoothly. However, if your mechanistic model is a very complex CFD simulation, where it's very difficult to get the gradients or even uh, an evaluation of your model, uh, this training becomes impossible. Okay, um, so what I showed you here mostly relates to stationary processes. So steady state processes. You can also use it for uh, dynamic processes, but then training becomes much more difficult. Um, and I briefly want to introduce to you a very common and very important dynamic model, uh, which is also a hybrid model structure that is called Hammerstein-Wiener model. And in a Hammerstein-Wiener model, the basic idea is that we have a Hammerstein block up front here, which is basically a non-linear static transformation of the inputs. So you get your input vector u of t in here, and you transform it using some non-linear function. And that could be a neural network again. Uh, and doing that, you get a uh, yeah, nonlinear transformed input W of t. And then any Hammerstein Wiener model has always uh, in the core a linear time invariant dynamic system. So this one is a dynamic system with linear dynamics. And the advantage is that this helps us to train this Hammerstein Wiener model later on much, much easier. Uh, so you compute these. Um, or you solve this linear uh, system. And then afterwards you get an output that, and you again transform it using this called Wiener block, which is again a static nonlinearity. Um, yeah, and these Hammerstein Wiener models are very common. Uh, you can find them in, in Python, in MATLAB, uh, and they're used in control applications and also for modeling chemical and biological systems. Okay, let me come back to the uh, very complex system of uh, integrating, for example, a complex PDE system, so partial differential equation, into a neural network. Uh, and this one is one example here. And uh, I will talk about a very, like one case study by Professor, uh, sorry, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, uh, Kanikadidis, sorry. <laughs> um, who's looking at, at this simple system here, where we have uh, a flow distributed over uh, one spatial coordinate and the time. And in this case, we have some training data available. It's actually very few training data if we look at this complex um, system here, which is just at the boundaries here, the black crosses again. Um, however, what we know about the system is that there is an underlying partial differential equation given for the system, which is right here. And we want to basically incorporate this system into the training of the neural network. And what this professor proposed to do is to encode this system while in the neural network training through a penalty term. So what he does is basically, he defines the neural network here, and this is a simple TensorFlow code. And he also defines f, which is basically this part here. So the right-hand side of this equation. And you can basically define it very simply in uh, TensorFlow as well. And then you can add it to the training objective. So this one down here is the training objective that you use in TensorFlow, which is the mean squared error here, u and uh, ui for the training data points. And then we add basically this one here, which is just a penalty term. term. We want this equation to be zero. So uh, we just add it to the, to the training. Uh, and that works because uh, yeah, it's very easy or it's possible in TensorFlow and very easy for you to implement uh, the derivatives 
of the neural network with respect to this coordinate. And it's very easy to add that to the objective function. And turns out, uh, yeah, it works very well. Okay, um, this is what I wanted to tell you about the basics of hybrid modeling. Um, now let's go to uh, optimization of hybrid models for optimal design and operation of processes. Uh, and I'd like to start with one uh, example from the literature. So um, this is an example from uh, Kremashi or Professor Kremashi and Fami. And what they did is they looked at an uh, ESM process, an ESM simulation for biodiesel production. And as you can see here on the right hand side, this is a rather uh, complex process. And also, if you look in detail, it's not only a process, it is actually a superstructure formulation. So what that means is there's redundant equipment inside here. So for example, like, let's look at this part here. What we see here, this one is a splitter. And then we have a cooler. We have basically a, you know, just a connection and we have a heater. Uh, and what the superstructure does is it gives the optimizer the flexibility to select not only the optimal operating point, but also the optimal design of the process. So there's an integer variable that gives you the flexibility to select whether this should be a heater, a cooler, or uh, nothing of those. Um, yeah, so it's a rather complex uh, optimization problem. And each of the unit super, uh, operations is simulated separately in SBIM Plus. And then after implementing each of the unit operations, what they did is they generated data for each of the unit operation, and then they fitted neural networks on these unit operations. And afterwards, they combined the neural networks. In this case, it's over 60 neural networks to a hybrid process model. Um, so why did they do it? They did it because, first of all, it's very difficult to uh, yeah, put together such a huge flow sheet in SM Plus and converge it afterwards. And this is in particular difficult when you want to optimize it. Because in optimization, what you will do is you will actually change the operating point. Here, you will also change the, uh, the equipment that you use. Uh, so it's very difficult to get this to converge. Um, yeah, and therefore they train the neural networks, they combine it to a hybrid superstructure. And then afterwards, they optimize um, or minimize the cost of this process using the local optimization algorithm DICOPT. Uh, so I guess everyone here knows what a local optimization algorithm is. Um, basically, you, lose, you use gradient information to converge to the next local optima. Um, however, we have a big risk here or problem because uh, when you use local optimization problems for a non-convex uh, optimization problem, you might converge to suboptimal local solutions. So why is this problem non-convex? Um, very easy because uh, user neural networks, they usually have a hyperbolic tangent activation function if you use them for regression here. And this is a non-convex function. Um, so what they found in their work actually is that um, they identified several operating points um, which are suboptimal in their local optimization. So they redid the optimization several times. And if we go to the literature, many people actually solved similar problems. So problems with trained neural networks embedded. And most of them used local optimization techniques, where some observed actually multiple local optimal solutions. Uh, a few people in the literature used stochastic global optimization techniques. Uh, so this might be a genetic algorithm. So you use some heuristic uh, to search globally. However, these algorithms can never guarantee to identify global optimal solutions. Um, so what I propose to do and what has been done in the literature very, uh, uh, yeah, j j just a few times is to use deterministic global optimization. And deterministic global optimization can guarantee to identify global optimal solutions. And in, in the previous literature, just a very few people have used deterministic global optimization using state-of-the-art solvers, 
like Baron, for example. And these works were limited to very small and shallow artificial neural networks. And the reason why uh, previous literature had, has been limited um, with this regard is because these problems are very difficult to solve. And the reason is if we look at a neural network, this is a very complex uh, uh, complete thing. And if you want to describe it in optimization, you usually have to describe it using equality constraints. So what you see here is a very simple example. We have x in, which are the inputs of the network, with one output, y out, and we want to minimize um, yeah, the prediction of the new network. So what we need to do is we need to write down all the equations that describe this complex uh, connectivity of the network. So what you see is um, that uh, we get a large scale nonlinear optimization problem. And these are very difficult to solve if you want to solve them to guaranteed optimality. So what we proposed very recently is to solve this kind of problem using a so-called reduced space approach. And unfortunately, I don't have time to go into all the details here. But basically, what we do is we solve all the equations for the output y out. So we use the property of a neural network that it's an explicit function. And then very similar to using backpropagation or automatic differentiation, what we do is we propagate McCormick relaxations and subgradient information through the computer code. Um, yeah, and relaxations are very important for global optimization. And I guess you need to visit an optimization class to understand more of the details here. Uh, but the advantage is that the optimization problem that we give to the optimizer, in this case, is much smaller from the dimensionality compared to the whole optimization problem that you can see on the left-hand side. So if we apply that to a very simple problem here, so we learned a 2D function. What you can see is that in the reduced space, we have two variables, which are x1 and x2, and no equality constraints because we eliminated all of them. While if we write down these problems in the full space, we get very large problems. And we solve these problems using all available um, solvers. And what you see is in reduced space, these problems are solved in the order of minutes, while in the full space, it's not feasible to solve these problems. And that's basically the, the reason why in the previous literature, people did not solve large scale uh, superstructures with neural networks uh, to global optimality, while now they can. And we did that in uh, one case study, which is very similar to the previous one. So we simulated the process in S Pen Plus. We generated data. We trained neural networks, in this case, just 14. We connected them using mass balances, and we optimized the process. And what you see again here is the problem size. So the full space has around 800 uh, equality constraints and variables, while the reduced space has just the degrees of freedom of our optimization. Then here, that's a so-called convergence plot. So on the x-axis, you see CPU time, while on the y-axis, it's the objective function value. In global optimization, what we want is we want to compute an upper bound and a lower bound on the global optimal solution. And we want these two bounds to converge. Uh, what you see is if you do it in the reduced space, this is a lower bound, it converges to the upper bound here. While if we uh, simulate this in the, or optimize it in the full space formulation, we see basically um, yeah, no convergence whatsoever in 10 to the five CPU seconds. Um, so what we did here is we did surrogate modeling. So we replaced models that we already had uh, using neural networks. And why did we do it? Because we wanted to reduce computational effort um, to make these problems tractable. However, we also have a risk here. We have a risk of introducing an additional error to our simulation because the neural network might be wrong, right? So it might not be a perfect fit for our um, for, for the physical model that we want to replace with the surrogate model. Um, so using 
global optimization, what we can do is we can actually compute a guaranteed accuracy of a, uh, of a surrogate model. And therefore we can answer the question, can we trust the surrogate model? Uh, and the concept what we uh, do here is very simple actually. So what we do is we maximize the error between the physical model here on the left-hand side, which is F mechanistic, and on the right-hand side, the neural network. And I want to emphasize, I'm not talking about the training process here. So we train the model offline using TensorFlow. What we do here is we verify the accuracy of the model. So F A N N is a trained, fully trained neural network. And we maximize the difference or the error between the mechanistic model and the neural network. And when we use global optimization here, we can guarantee to identify the maximum error. Uh, in this case, it's uh, this number here. And what it basically tells us is that the neural network is very accurate. And we do not, or we just make in the worst case, this error when we replace the rigorous flash model with the neural network. Um, if you want to apply this, uh, not only to surrogate models, but also to actual uh, models from processes, what you face is that your data might not be distributed in a hyper-rectangle. So in many cases, you don't just have lower and upper bounds, but instead you might have uh, separated clusters, uh, non-convex regions. Uh, you might even have holes in your data set. And what many people do in the literature is they uh, use the convex hull criterion to estimate the validity of a data-driven model. And what I'd like to emphasize here is uh, that that might not be sufficient because you might have uh, invalid extrapolation or invalid, let's say, evaluation of your data-driven model, even though you're in the convex hull. Uh, and this is particularly true if you get data from uh, some company, for example. So what I propose to do is to uh, train another model, in this uh, case, a one-class support vector machine to learn uh, the validity domain, the boundary of our data in order to later on use that as a constraint in the optimization to avoid, uh, avoid unvalid uh, model evaluations. Um, so that was actually what I wanted to tell you about hybrid modeling and optimization. Um, I also do some other work that I want to very briefly mention. Uh, so what else? Uh, I work a lot with colleagues uh, on learning from molecular graphs, which is a very interesting field. Uh, so maybe you're interested in it as well. Uh, so what we do there is we basically have an input to our neural network, which is a graph or a molecule, a smile string of a molecule, and an output as a property, for example. Uh, and there is a very interesting structure of neural network, which is called graph convolutional neural network, where we can take this molecule as an input and learn the property in an end-to-end -end way. So very interesting, very new research, and I highly recommend to look into it. Uh, another very interesting uh, field of my application is automated chemistry, uh, also probably related to your uh, studies. Uh, where we design um, experiments that are executed by uh, automated flow chemistry or even robots. And then the results are returned to the machine learning algorithm, which learns from these experiments uh, and use that to design new experiments. Uh, okay, with that I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Um, please connect to me on whatever LinkedIn or Twitter. I'm happy to answer questions afterwards and I'm happy to connect to you. Thanks a lot.